this on? You guys can hear me? Okay, so I am going to try and not repeat uh, what Frank said earlier, uh, although we have been sharing slides back and forth between us. So um, I do have uh, approximately 20 some odd slides, and uh, obviously I'm not going to be able to get through all of the details. I know a lot of you have been asking what what is actually in it, what's not in it, uh, what does it cover, what doesn't it cover, and it, um, it's not a solution for the entire STV, uh, but uh, like we were talking about, so I'm going to try and highlight exactly on the parts that we are specifying inside a U protocol. And it's called a protocol because uh, it's a specification that we have uh, written, and uh, then we started to implement it on various different deployments inside of Android is the one we're going to release, but then there's also ones, uh, solutions for the cloud, for the mobile phone, and so on. So um, I'm going to skip over the problem statement, the why, because Frank covered that as well. Uh, jump over the, the little bit of details about what protocol is. I have a couple slides on uh, how, so like kind of the building blocks, three layers. So Frank showed the slide of the three layers, but I'll focus on that. And um, these slides will be shared with everyone afterwards. It's a Google Doc. It will be open for anyone to see, um, you know, and and uh, all the detailed slides. So I have only about maybe eight slides that I'll cover today, and then the rest will be back up that uh, we could talk about this afternoon or later as well. So I'll skip over these things. And um, you know, Frank mentioned uh, earlier today that it's a uh, a SOA 2.0 architecture. So you know, we move from a signal based to a service oriented architecture to an event based service oriented architecture and they're quite different. Um, we like to use earlier yesterday the orchestration and what does orchestration actually mean. Uh, I'm going to throw another one in there is uh, choreography, right? Like if you look at um, uh, some IP, uh, a lot is centralized into these entities that work on the device, which is like the uh, discovery service. But what we're trying to do with um, with uh, our alt U protocol is we're trying to do like centralized orchestration with the uh, the functionality at the application layer, but then uh, distributed uh, uh, choreography, meaning that uh, a subscription will work for applications and services um, across multiple devices. So um, I'll get into a little bit more about that afterwards because I think it'll be uh, important to explain what that really means. Uh, resiliency is really important what we wanted to build into the protocol because we want this, um, this, these implementations that are going to be running on these different devices, we want them to work reliably independent of each other. So if I have something that is running on one device um, and the other device is not connected because in an event-based architecture, these components are, um, are very, um, very temporal and not guaranteed to be connected and and uh, available. So they need to be able to function independent of each other. These uh, these devices that implement the protocol. So resiliency is super important and discoverability, like Frank mentioned. So I'll I'll skip over it. But one of the things I want to highlight that he uh, didn't necessarily um, mention was about a uh, consistent developer mental model. So we want we what the protocol does define. So this is the big what does it actually define and I'll show some pictures. It's a ubiquitous language. So we want a developer to understand that if they are uh, writing an application or building a service and you implement a subscription pattern, right? Or a, um, a discovery pattern, the logic is the same no matter where you go and no matter what the implementation is underneath. The point being is that um, if you have an application that's going to subscribe to a topic that's being emitted from a service, it doesn't matter where the service is on the internet or even if it's like sitting right next to it on a, a bus that it could directly connect to. The, the concept is the same. The mechanisms are the same. The APIs are the same. So I subscribe and if the implementation of the subscription management is uh, a some IP daemon, or if the subscription management is covered by some proprietary solution uh, running on a central broker or whatever, it's still the same subscription management, still the same uh, discovery service. So we want a consistent mental model for all developers and for 
a ubiquitous language that will mean that events that are emitted from these services, the things that are emitted from the services, uh, can come from one location in one language and flow through the system, and I'll show what that means afterwards, to other, um, to other consumers or applications anywhere in, um, in this connected network. So um, the things that we've used as a building block is for defining our, our uh, services, these things at the application layer. We're using Protobuf because um, at least in our case for defining uh, our subscription management entity, software entity, our uh, discovery service entity, our digital twin entity. These services that we are consider are foundational. They're, they're what we call core services, and I'll show you some diagrams afterwards. These entities are foundational and important that every single device needs to implement. So if I'm going to implement the protocol in, in one Android virtual machine, and I have another um, instance of U protocol with apps and services packaged together in another, let's say, virtual machine or another controller or so on. They all have to have these subscription management entities, uh, discovery service entities. They need to be able to talk to each other in a consistent way. So we use for the clean, key, uh, clear contracts for these entities, we use protobuf. Um, now, some of you might say, well, as we're defining services, uh, we could use some other IDL language or so on. That's fine, but for our, uh, we chose Protobuf as our uh, clean, clear contract because it um, it supports every programming language that we want to use. It supports uh, also built-in serializer that we use for certain purposes. Um, and this does not mean, as we say, like a U protocol is using Protobuf. Uh, as French Frank mentioned, it does not mean that. Uh, your vehicle services have to be defined with Protobuf. You could use whatever Covisa is using uh, with BSS or something else for your defining of your um, service logic. But for our core components, like the subscription manager, we define uh, the contract at what we call the application layer, and I'll explain that after. The um, contract for the subscription manager and others using Protobuf. Um, the Cloud event was a big thing actually uh, that was quite uh, an interesting uh, mindset to get into this automotive world. So if you can imagine, uh, for those who work with um, deeply embedded uh, mechatronics folks, uh, anytime you put the word cloud in something, it scares people. So what we did is we tried to explain folks that cloud event is not uh, a lot of people look at a cloud event and they see like a string URL and they see like a type. Anyone who's worked it. First of all, um, how many people have heard of cloud event or use cloud events? OK, one, two, three, four. OK, I was expecting a lot more. So um, it's really it's it's a it's an organization. Well, sorry, the CNCF is the one that uh, is the standard body that organizes or, or defines the cloud event standard. And what the standard is, is it's a um, is a common way to describe events. OK, so it's it's really a ubiquitous language for eventing. And by that it means that, you know, if I'm going to send an event, I need to describe the event. Everybody and their uncle has come up with their own version of what an event is. So rather than us coming up with another event called, uh, you know, GM event or something else, we wanted to use a common standard for describing events. And in our event, you have, you know, where did the event come from? When was the event generated? What is the type of event? Is the event a published event? Is it a command? Is it a, a response? Also, information like, you know, the payload of the event. What is the uh, format of that event, uh, what is the schema of the event, and so on. Cloud event provides a way of describing your events, but then you could represent the event in many different formats. So that was the conceptual thing we're trying to do with your protocol at the layer two that I'll show afterwards, meaning that we want everybody in our company, at least for GM, and this is why we think it might be beneficial for the industry, is we want everyone to come to an agreement on how to describe events, 
now you could represent the events in different formats. So if I if we can come to an agreement, which by the way, it's not easy even within GM for us to do this. So if for us to agree uh, a deeply embedded mechatronics person to agree on um, how to describe a mechatronics based event and have that same description flow through the system over to the cloud. And that's what we're doing using cloud events. So example, a door open event happens at, um, from a mechatronics uh, microcontroller. We describe it, we provide all that metadata for the event. And then what we do is we flow that event up into the cloud. Now it's converted from you know, a some IP packet over to um, a, a, um, uh, an MQTT packet and then went over HTTP to somebody else. But the descriptive information of that event still stays the same because we all agreed how to address and so on and so forth. Now, if we want to use a, a common way of describing an event, um, so you could think of uh, the events as like our, our packet definition, right? Every packet has a source and sync. And so in order for us to use addresses, we went with the URL and we used the, uh, the URIs here and we started coming up with a schema that would work with any parser because you know we want to we don't want to reinvent the wheel we just want to use existing uh, RFC parsers that exist out there and this was really done because uh, as Frank mentioned yesterday I'm connecting a mechatronics that's inside of uh, an MCU uh, farm that's somewhere it not it's not necessarily addressable at an IP layer or any other layer to somebody in the cloud or on your phone. So in order for me to be able to address it, I need to be able to um, associate it by a name. So we use DNS principles in the authority to be able to map like names to uh, addresses so I can actually route the events. And so we use these URIs in order for us to be able to uh, provide in it a, a full descriptive information of where the event came from, where the event needs to go. And so the events are, uh, as Frank mentioned, there's a couple of types. We have a request event, response event, a published event, and a file event. Uh, the published event could be a, you know, I'm multicasting to many people or unicasting to uh, one person, which is like a notification. But I need to I need to route this event. So we use this representation. Now the um, it's a URI as a string. That's one of the fields of a cloud event, but then we represent it in different ways. So you know someone who's looking at this and says, well, in an, in an Azel D environment, I can't use a string uh, an open ended string and we agree with you. We can't. So what we're doing is we've all agreed on the information we need that's described in the cloud event and we represent it in different forms. So. If you look at um, further versions of uh, the presentation and, and follow on things that we will commit, you will notice that you know we have uh, IDs instead of um, strings because we we do mapping of like Every uh, software entity has uh, a number and things like that. Short story long, by agreeing on uh, an addressing schema, it allows us to be able to uh, put a stamp on an event and say that the event came from here and it needs to go there. And that's that's one of the problems that we solve is how does an event get from one guy down in the mechatronics all the way up to the cloud or vice versa, or even from within the mechatronics to the mechatronics or from the from uh, you know one SOC to another SOC, one ECU to another ECU and so on. So we've we've uh, we reuse principles of DNS because I want to be able to use a DNS resolver to you know convert IP addresses to device names and so on. Um, and then talking about the layers, which is important, I think. And Frank showed this slide afterwards. The key is that we split it up into three layers for a purpose, and this actually came later. So we wrote the protocol. We continued to improve it, to add it as we were developing, learned a lot of things. As we explain 
um, this concept to our developers, you know, we saw that people were constantly struggling mixing up what we didn't define as layers, but then in our head we find it, it cleared, it dawned on us that you know we need to clearly identify what these layers are. The reason being is that if we are, you know, a, a team in GM that's developing, let's say, um, a uh, a parking service. So the team that's developing the parking service. Uh, they need to come up with their business logic. They need to define what are their APIs, what is the interaction with all of the applications that are going to use it. But they they don't need to care about when their parking service is going to um, emit an event that says, uh, you know, spot uh, 50 spots are available. Here are their geolocations. Uh, they just want to publish the event and not care who the consumers are, where they are, or any of those things. So by splitting up the layers and saying, you just do your business logic, you build your service, which is not an easy task. You define what we call the payload of those messages going back and forth. Then it decouples the, um, the, the business logic layer, the application layer from the eventing layer. So a SOA 2.0 architecture is all building things on top of an eventing uh, architecture, which is what we did. And the idea is that you can equate it to if I'm going to show you uh, a Gmail, right? Uh, you know, business logic of how Gmail works with the APIs and so on. You're not going to show routers and switches and uh, cloud gateways and stuff in your diagram. You're going to assume that that all works because, you know, HTTP, uh, it works on top of HTTP. We're doing the same concept. We're building on top of clean layers with um, uh, roles and responsibilities of each layer, and then we implement those layers on the different uh, levels. So summary, the application layer is really about the business logic. What are you going to do uh, for setting the, the payload? And in here, the protocol defines business logic that is important for us to be able to do routing and eventing. So Core business logic includes things like subscription management. So an application wants to subscribe to something, they will subscribe to a topic, right? So we 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 provide a clean interface, clean, clear contract of how to do subscription, and it's the consistent across everywhere. Then that is the subscription, the discovery, and the twin are three core uh, business logic things that we define at that application layer of our protocol. And then the second layer about the eventing, this is where um, a lot of the magic happens in that <laughs> if I want to uh, have a common representation of an event and have it flow through the system, then the whole system needs to know how to do the routing of these events. We call it dispatching. So we build in this layer information into the cloud event header. And by the way, we're not changing the cloud event spec. What we're doing actually is we're uh, taking the existing cloud event spec. They say you could, this is a cloud event spec. This is how you represent it in MQTT. This is how you represent it in um, JSON, in XML, and so on, different formats. We're using all that. And then we're extending it by, by adding automotive specific ones that work inside of an embedded environment that can't use strings and so on. Having said all that, the header information inside of this, this packet or cloud event contains information about where to route it. What's super important as well is by decoupling these layers um, from the mental model of developers, they don't have to worry about the routing, like I said, but as well, it's a consistent um, behavior for how these events flow through the system. Uh, a application is going to send an event to the next guy, right? It's Fundamentally, it's point to point. So I'm going to send that event to the next guy, the first dispatcher. That dispatcher sends it to the next dispatcher or turns around and sends it to the, the, the local person who needs to, to receive it. So basic eventing principles, but we've put it into the protocol to say that this is how you're supposed to dispatch events. Uh, I'll give you examples of different kind of dispatchers and what their roles are in the next slide. But the layer two is all about dispatching how do you um, how do you send 
receive? What are the information you put in the header in order to get it to the right destination? Then the third layer is um, not the um, it's 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 not the uh, the hail mary or the, the the magic, but it's really we all understand. And the problem that we have is uh, as a community in SDV, and we had in our company is is the crossing the transport and the paradigms in uh, problem where, you know, in my environment here, it talks this language. In another protocol here, it talks another language. In fact, I had a discussion with a developer um, not too long ago, and they're like, well, actually, I can do something with IPv6 from end to end, doing this, that, and natting and rules and so on. But that gets away from the goal of what we wanted to do with protocol, which is we want the flexibility that if you have something that talks DDS, we want you to still be able to use DDS. If you have something that talks MQTT, you can use MQTT. So what we've done is we created a layer that builds on top of OSI layer seven um, uh, protocols. And what it does is it, it takes that cloud event and says, this is how you send a cloud event over these, what we're calling transports. So if you can imagine, we're not using, I'll give you an example. We're not using MQTT as a centralized broker. We're using it as a transport. What does that mean? It means I'm, uh, our MQTT transport is going to be point to point. So let's say between a vehicle and a cloud. I send it to the cloud. The payload of the MQTT packet is just the cloud event. So the, the other end that's receiving it, the dispatcher that receives that cloud event, then figures out where it needs to route it. It doesn't use the MQTT to do the fanning out or the multicasting or so on. It's just the transport. Why? Because it allows us to get all of the features and functions of the, that MQTT provides, right? Like of the heartbeat of the always connected, um, the, the fact that it's implemented everywhere. But it, it also means that I don't have to change the MQTT standard to get this to work. I don't have to change uh, DDS, AMQT, HTTP. I only have five minutes left. Wow. So what we do is we write, um, we write a specification that says, this is how you bind your cloud event to these transports. That's what a spec does, and then we implement it. Then the two ends need to, the two end software needs to implement that thing. So, all right, if you can imagine, I still have every little thing I'm talking about here. I have a slide in more detail. So given I only have uh, three minutes left, what we do, what you protocol includes as a specification, and then we implement the crap out of it, is um, it, it defines these different kinds of categories. We, um, uh, we went crazy and put a U in front of everything because why not? So um, if you see a UE, that means that really it means that it talks U protocol. But again, it doesn't mean that all of your software now has to be thrown out in something else. It just means that your existing software knows how to talk U protocol. So there's different uh, um, specialization of categories of UEs. We talked about dispatchers. So we have a bus where a bus means that all of the software that's connected to it are on the same transport. That's in a nutshell. If they're in Android, they all talk binder. A streamer is really like a gateway or some uh, a gateway between transports. So inside of um, the Android implementation, when we open source it, you'll see a, a streamer. It's going to talk binder and it's also going to talk uh, MQTT because we're going to have it talk to a cloud implementation. Uh, that streamer can then implement a another transport to some IP or some others. And then a DPR is the, the magic that really connects. It's a device proxy router, so it allows one device and another device that can't see each other, but be able to just route between each other. That, that was the, our solution for a mobile phone connecting to a vehicle. It flows through this cloud, but using the cloud event source and sync address and so on, they can address each other. Um, so this is all, like we say at the layer two, you'll see UPL1, UPL2 in the spec and so on. These are the communication layers. They don't have APIs, right? They're just dispatching of events, the event dispatchers. Then we have this guy that does the, those have contracted interfaces, a subscription. 
so you will see something in uh, use subscription that will have an API subscribe, unsubscribe and so on. Everybody talks the same language, the same contract, the same interface. So an app running inside of Android and an app running inside of the cloud, they all talk the same subscribe API, subscribe language, and then it gets implemented differently elsewhere. And that is where we had the biggest struggle between our cloud team and our vehicle team. They were like, we do it this way and they do it that way. But the reality is we want to do it in a common way. Otherwise, you don't have that uh, consistent mental model, which is what we wanted to do. So I know I don't have time, <laughs> so I'm going to end with an example of this is one of the diagrams that uh, that uh, we drew initially. It kind of shows how everything is all interconnected in a network of uh, and then you could build these kind of uh, topology diagrams uh, for sending these events. But in a nutshell, what we want is imagine this is the cloud and this is a um, some device inside of the vehicle the, and you have your this is let's say your telematics module and this is your infotainment system. This app wants to do something with this service and they talk in the same mental model. They communicate the same way. They just use the same APIs. They subscribe. They receive published events, so on and so forth. And then the layer two items take care of all of the routing of those events all between each other. And that's what we've implemented. So by breaking it down into smaller, easier problems to solve, We've been able to figure out how can I actually do this when this guy, this bus talks HTTP because that's what the cloud does. This guy talks Binder because that's what the, that does. This guy talks some IP, so um, you know we can do it that way. But then by building these components and connecting the dots, they now can talk in the same ubiquitous language, which is what U protocol is. And uh, as you can tell, I have so much to do. That's uh, not do, but so much more to say and share. So uh, it can be available afterwards. So thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Questions? Okay. Uh, You're closer, so you. Hi. <laughs> when will you click publish? Because I want that code. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, we're in the process of. Um, of getting it ready. And so we are on a tight deadline as well because we are shipping this stuff. So um, we're trying to uh, plan how we're going to release it in a way that it won't uh, disturb the development teams to getting it into our production vehicles. So the incubation period is six months. We're hoping very much to get it in before six months, at least what we call the SDK project, because the SDK project is the foundation that even within GM we're using for all of the different implementations that we have. So if we were planning to get that out and then um, so that way we can engage with some other folks who have already committed to do like a, a cloud solution and a other solution. Um, so that's first within a couple months is our target. And then at the latest September we're uh, going to release the Android where you'll see a U bus, a U streamer, um, a sample, only a sample application and services. So again, this without the apps and services is really, uh, you know, it's it's nothing. We're hoping the concept of you build it, uh, they will come <laughs> for the apps and services. But also, uh, our goal is um, at the end of the day, if people can um, uh, never have to know that the protocol exists. And they just the developers just work about the uh, this rich set of apps and services that when you click publish, it builds the code that fills in the stubs that creates the cloud events and all that stuff. Then that's our target within GM, and we're hoping with the community too. So I think I answered your question. Yes. Um, I was wondering what is the um, expected main contribution point? So what what would you like us to contribute to this to the thing? I, I would imagine protocol bindings, stuff like that. OK, uh, yes, so it's it's um, additional implementations because uh, like different protocols. So there's like the eCal project. There's all these other projects. Now if we can get them to talk the protocol or at least implement the protocol requirements, uh, then we have a solution where we can say the summer, for example, 
The summer now is U protocol compliant and they just plug in. Uh, another one is we would love to see a QNX, like Frank was mentioning, a QNX implementation of the protocol, a, um, a Linux implementation, uh, uh, Microsoft Cloud, uh, Azure Cloud and others. And I'm, I'm getting the hook 